Welcome to video number 26 in the Using iTrain tutorial series. My name is Bob and this is part 4 in our understanding of train routes. Welcome back. In the last tutorial we looked at the three action tabs in train routes. In this tutorial we will run through the remaining train route options which we have yet to cover. We'll talk about the role of stations in train routes and we'll summarize the train route rules and recommendations. Let's open the editor with Control, Shift and F4. In this Blocks tab, I think we've covered all the other options that are shown here. The one thing we haven't talked about is this Position field here. This determines where the train will stop in the block if a wait has been called for. And we've got Default, Start and End. For Default, if we are using a station, and depending on the availability of a platform in that station and the type of train, it will stop the train either alongside the platform or at the end of the block at the stop position. If we are not using a station, then default means that the train will stop at the stop position at the end of the block. Start means the train will stop at the start of the block, which is just the stop position in the other direction. If you recall, when we set up the blocks, we set a stop position at minus five centimeters at either end of the block. So that means five centimeters from either end. And end means always at the end of the block at the stop position. So the last thing we need to talk about here is this option station. It may or may not surprise you to hear that stations have no specific role in train routes other than allowing a train to stop alongside a platform, as we've just mentioned, or as a quick, convenient way of including multiple blocks in a step. In a train route, we can select the station option instead of the blocks option if we had a station that we have defined. But all that we are essentially doing is selecting the blocks that are included in that station. So it's a quick way of including blocks without having to enter them all individually as you would do in the blocks tab. Stations were developed primarily for using with automatic routing. So we will look at stations in detail during the future tutorial on automatic routing. Okay, so the last tab that we need to cover is the options tab. We've already discussed the repeat count in previous tutorials. The reservation count here is the number of blocks a route tries to reserve in front of the current block of the train. The default setting is two blocks, which is adequate for most situations. So iTrain would try to reserve two blocks ahead of where the train is currently located. And that track would turn orange to indicate that it's reserved. 
meaning that no other trains could reserve those blocks or enter those blocks whilst they're reserved. Now you might have a situation where you want to reduce the reserve count so that a block is freed up for use by another train. Or you may want to increase the reserve count so that a particular block is reserved for that particular train. The reserve count is not a guarantee, it's a best effort on iTrain's part. It will, however, never try to reserve past a block with a waiting time specified in the route until the train has stopped and the waiting time has passed. In some cases, you may see that iTrain reserves more blocks. If the train cannot stop in the last reserved block, or if it is a critical block. The reserved start is the number of blocks that must be reserved before a train can actually depart after it has been waiting at a stop or when a route has been activated. You could use this for example if you have a train stopped at a platform and two blocks ahead there is a signal that is at stop. You could increase the reserved start count to cover that stop signal. That would prevent the train from leaving the platform and then having to wait a second time just in front of the signal. Instead the train would stay at the platform until the signal is cleared. It doesn't affect when the signal is cleared, it only affects the departure time of the waiting train. The options direction change specifies if a direction of the train may be changed whilst executing the route. These two determine whether it is allowed or not. And the third option, dependent on train, will allow the train to drive only in the direction with a cabin at the front. And this is the default setting. If we have a mixed route set, the shunting part is always allowed to drive in both directions. If the option set turnout always is selected, it is guaranteed that all the turnouts will be activated by the interface, even when the program thinks they are already in the correct state. This does cost a little more in terms of switching time, but prevents errors by manual changes of the turnouts outside of the program. I personally choose to have this set. If the option here called Use Type Permissions is not selected, which is the default setting, then the route will ignore the permissions defined at the train type for this route. In other words, it will ignore any of the train type permissions that we have set here in the train type editor. So that option is useful if you have permissions in here which would normally limit a train in driving automatically without a route, but in specific train routes you want to be able to access these blocks anyway. So if a train is driving without a train route, it would obey the permissions. And if it was running a specific train route, it would ignore these permissions. We'll jump back to the train route again. And the last option here is continuous route. 
normally when we have a route that is going to be repeated the last step in that route needs to have a weight against it. Now if for any reason you don't want to have a weight there you can tick this option here which tells iTrain that it is a continuous route and iTrain will therefore not cause an error to be shown if a weight was not in that last step. Right, so that is the end of the tutorials on train routes. So we'll just finish up by summarizing what we have learnt. This is a table listing the rules for train routes. So just use this as a reference and pause the video so that you can read it. A train route must have at least one 100% weight somewhere in the route. And the second rule says use 100% weight in the last step of the route, which kind of makes that first rule redundant. But the important thing is to make sure that it is 100% weight and not less than 100 the last step in a marker loop must contain a 100% weight. We can see our marker loop indicated by these two arrows here. And the last step here has a 100% weight. The start and finish marker must contain exactly the same block or blocks. So in our example, the last step in the loop contains these three blocks and the first step in the loop contains the same three blocks. In a circular route without markers the last item in the route should also be available earlier in the route. In our example here the last step in the route is available as the first step in this particular route, which is the preferred position to put it if you can. Use a shunt or mixed route whenever a route contains a shunting maneuver. Well, in our example here, the last step was to shunt the train back into south siding and so we have set it as a mixed route up here. And we had clicked the shunt option down here. And this is a table of recommendations and comments which you can use for reference. Create and test your routes using unidirectional trains so that shunting maneuvers are taken into account. Um, in terms of unidirectional trains, we mean something like a steam train or a train that contains wagons. If you're using this enter occupied block option, the actual block properties must also be set to use that option. So you need to use the block editor in the edit menu to check that that particular block has the enter occupied block ticked. Where possible, avoid using shunt maneuvers within a marker loop. We talked about that at some length. And we talked about an alternative solution of using actions and relays, which we'll show in a future tutorial to allow us to join routes together and avoid having to use shunts within markers. And remember, you don't have to use markers to loop a train route. A simple train route without markers will loop from the last step to an earlier step. So avoid using markers if it's not necessary. The first step in a route does not need a weight. So in our example here, we can remove that weight. There's no use for having it there. 
because we already have a wait in the last step from which it will loop to this step here. And the last recommendation in our table is to use direction next and previous where possible instead of both. And that will avoid iTrain selecting ambiguous routes. OK, so that is all for this tutorial. I'm not entirely sure what the next tutorial will be. It will either be about stations and automatic routing, or we'll be talking about actions and relays. Hope to see you then. Take care.